and welcome to Good Game Spawn Point. The show for younger gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm... I'm Darren, data analysing robot for the ruthless extermination of noobs. And I'm Bajo, and I don't interrupt people. <laughs> this weekend, our review of How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> and we'll hand down your verdict in our weekly One Face review. And this week, it's Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. <laughs> Have you seen the movie How to Train Your Dragon, Darren? I loved it. Affirmative. I love all movies animated by computer. You know, Darren, there are people working those computers from behind. It's not just the computers doing it. Oh. Way to spoil it for me. How to Train Your Dragon is an adorable film about a young boy that befriends a dragon and then has grand adventures riding around on its back. But we're not here to review the movie, we're here to review the game. It's one of the sad facts of gaming that movie tie-in games, with a few notable exceptions, are usually total rubbish. James Cameron, who made Avatar, said that this is because games take a lot longer to make than movies, so the games are often rushed out and therefore bad. With How to Train Your Dragon, you know, I was prepared to be disappointed with the game in comparison to the movie, but I was at least expecting it to be like the movie. But no, instead we got this weird Pokemon-like dragon fighting game. I wasn't quite sure what to make of it at first. Yeah, me either. You can play it as either Hiccup or Astrid, and you're first given a dragon to train up in the practice arena to get the combo attacks down. But they're so simple, pretty soon you realise that it's not about getting you to learn how to use the combos, but more about training up your dragon. What's more, you'll need to practice the same move over and over again and then fight every battle four times just to level up. I'm showing that dragon Massive yawn. Yeah, it's pretty dull. You'll be filling out a talent tree which will decide what kind of fighter you want your dragon to be and as you level up your attacks that'll unlock different dragon customization options or food or potion recipes. And anytime your dragon does anything he'll need to rest and you'll also need to keep him happy and keep him fed and keep him healed and this is done by going around the very small world and collecting items and Hex is nothing lazier than an item collecting quest and this is basically all you do when you're not training or fighting. I know, you'll have to dig, forage, tackle, pull, push, just to get the various collectible items you'll need to make a tasty treat for your dragon or a healing soul. It's really repetitive and not much fun. Occasionally you'll be given a quest from one of the other characters in the game, but they're all collecting quests too. There's a cave you can go to with fun challenges for you and your dragon, but it's just a series of annoying mini-games which just, once again, unlock more recipes and customization. Ultimately, the aim of this game is to pit your dragon against other dragons and work your way up the leaderboard to get to the very top. Achieving this will unlock a new dragon in which you have to level up right from scratch all over again. KO! You can collect up to four different dragons, gotta catch them all. In the tournaments, you'll need to repeatedly pitch dragon against dragon, and in some of the harder battles, choose which dragon will best suit your opponent. Mostly, though, you'll just be mashing X and Y repeatedly. There is an arcade mode, too, which you can battle against friends. Yeah, I mean, I actually couldn't believe it when I realised that that's all this game was. And usually with these kinds of games, they at least impress you with a high production value, but for a big-budget movie game, even that wasn't that great. I mean, half the time, they didn't even bother to sync up the dialogue properly. Almost, but not quite. You aren't ready. The only thing I really enjoyed about this game was the dragon customization. Messing around with the colours, wings, markings and horns was quite fun to make some really cool looking reptiles and in arcade mode it is cool to see your creations pitched against friends. But ultimately even the customization options were limited. I wanted to make some seriously ridiculous looking beasts but you know all my options were pretty standard. You never really interact with your dragon either. When you're out collecting you're on foot and when you're fighting you're already on the dragon and Everything else is just menus, and Hex is just not what I expected from this game at all. No, me either, but let's wrap this up. Yeah, everything in this game is tedious. The fighting, the collect quests, keeping a dragon happy and fed, and it just doesn't begin to capture the adventure of the film at all. If you've got a birthday coming up, I'd recommend telling your rels not to get you this game. I'm giving it 5 out of 10 rubber chickens. Yeah, I was hoping for good fantasy action adventure fun and instead I got this grindy repetitive fighting game and I loved the movie too so I was really disappointed. I'm giving it five and a half rubber chickens. Time now for us to open up the inbox and embark on our quest to answer more of your perplexing gaming conundrums. First up, this one's from Nerad in Intronville. 
Why is Darren the robot so awesome? Well, I'm not sure if we would describe him as awesome, but he certainly can be useful, rarely, as he does contain a database of every single game ever made, even though he's rubbish at playing most of them. Next, this one from Dana in Inya TVs. What does Darren do when he's not presenting good game spawn point? Uh, well, Darren keeps his database up to date. Information on Super Mario Galaxy 2. I'll just hack into the Nintendo mainframe. Yes, get into Shiggy's personal files. Oh, there aren't nearly enough robots in this game. I'll just hack that and hack this. Ah, thousands of robots. Excellent. And scans for noobs. That's right. When Darren has finished his good game duties, he can usually be found out and about detecting noobs. Darren has an internal sensor which sounds an alarm if a noob is in the area. Noob detected. Charging my laser. Moving quickly on. Ah, this just in from Aaron from I Is A Star. Where does Darren live? There's a lot of questions about Darren today. Yeah, too many. Well, he has a special facility, the Darren Cave, full of high-end equipment where he monitors all the world's noob activity and sizes up targets for extermination. CRO on the wall, who's the biggest noob of all? So many noobs, so little time. Oh, on to... Dazza from Floor 6. I'd like to send Darren a very large and very expensive gift. How should I do this? Right, there's definitely something going on. I'm, I'm gonna go check. Dear Bajo and Hex, the robot is brilliant. I think Darren should have his own channel. Sincerely, Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister. Send. Darren, what are you doing? Oh, uh, just sending some emails. Well, stop it! Ask good gamers for viewers' questions, not for lots of silly stuff about you. Now, cut it out. Yeah, I can't find my sandwich. I don't know where it is. I've got to go. Right. That's got him sorted. He was spamming the inbox. We shouldn't have any more trouble from him now, though. We've just got time for one more, and this one is from Jacob in Bendigo, Victoria. My parents won't let me buy a Darren. Can you lend yours to me? Right. This has to stop. I'm going to wipe his hard drive, Hex. Well, actually, Bajo, I think this one's fair dinkum. Jacob, thanks for your question, but I'm afraid we can't lend you Darren unless you can build your own Darren-grade laser-proof danger room. You see, Darren considers everyone a noob, and as we don't actually want anyone to be exterminated, he needs to let off a few shots now and then so he doesn't blow a fuse. All right, let's do this. Okay, be careful. Barjo, Hex, how dare you disturb me? Can't you see I'm firing my laser? No, no, no. Firing my laser! Firing my laser! Firing my laser! And that's all we have time for this week. If you have a non-Darren related question about video games, please be sending it to us here. I'm stuck. Oh, what have you done? I don't know. Oh, that's really... How do you do these things? Welcome to Spawn Point to Sex, where we pull apart games to find out why we love them so. So far we've looked at character health, loading screens, cutscenes, crates, power-ups. Now it's time to put the spotlight on our virtual friends, those non-player characters. The player character is who you are when you're in a game, which makes anyone controlled by the computer a non-player character, or NPC for short. The term originated from role-playing games, where the player was more likely to interact with characters that weren't monsters. That's right, and depending on how good a game's artificial intelligence is, an NPC might join us on a quest, or fight by our side, or they might only be smart enough to stand around while we ask them a question. RPGs would get nowhere without a few NPCs for us players to talk to. Affirmative, though it's important that an NPC's behaviour is believable, or at the very least that they respond to you in a glitch-free manner. So, Darren, the enemies you fight in a game are NPCs too, right? Affirmative. Technically, you're correct, Hex, but enemies are more commonly referred to as the enemy AI, or mobs. That's because the term non-player character is typically reserved for characters that are friendly, or at least neutral to the player. Right, like the villagers that buy up all your low-level junk or, or wait around to hand out a quest. And hey, NPCs might also just be there to lighten the mood after a long slog of combat like Captain Quark in Ratchet and Clank, or, or Navi in The Legend of Zelda, and they might also just be there to provide some snippets of useful information. Do a 
barrel roll. NPCs have certainly evolved over the years to appear more and more lifelike. They've started walking, talking and pulling facial expressions to really make you believe that you're interacting with a real person. It used to be that they just say the same thing over and over again. Affirmative. But now they're programmed to respond in a variety of ways. You kid? Yeah! <laughs> Some NPCs don't even have to talk at all to have an effect on you. What you need is someone nice to look after you. Would you like to know who my favourite NPC is? Affirmative. It's Stan, the annoying salesman from The Secret of Monkey Island. His jacket defies the laws of physics. And what's your favourite NPC, Hex? Oh, well, it'd have to be the town crier from Fable 2. The time is very late. It's funny. Hmm. Affirmative. No, that's a good choice. Very good. What's wrong with it? No, nothing. Nothing at all. It's a very good choice. You have very good opinions for a human. Why don't I believe you? This is the whole thing. <laughs> see, this show just isn't working. You see, the fact that I'm here and perfect makes everything difficult. Can't work like you this. humans are intrinsically inferior. I always have to put up with your opinions. You're always making mistakes. And here I am, a beacon of perfection. Who would have thought that two of gaming's most bitter rivals would end up in the same game together? Now that Sega don't make consoles anymore, Sonic the Hedgehog is free to team up with whomever he likes. The result? A Nintendo and Sega love fest with Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. But do two classic game characters automatically make a game awesome? I'm not sure the statistics would support such a claim. Hence the one face review. You take a photo of yourself giving a thumbs up, sideways or down, then we give them to Darren here to collate the ultimate result. But before we get Darren to crunch the numbers, let's take a look at what happens when a plumber and a hedgehog collide. Mario and Sonic used to just promote their respective consoles, the Sega Mega Drive vs Super Nintendo, the N64 vs the Dreamcast, but in Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games they're much more interested in racing each other to the finish line, going toe to toe in archery, or clashing epes in a bit of fencing. But Mario and Sonic weren't the only familiar faces. You could also play as characters like Yoshi, Luigi, Knuckles, Tails, you could even use your Mii characters too. The setting of the 2008 Beijing Olympics made this game perfect for a multiplayer party and when combined with the waggle of a Wii remote, the gameplay could really heat up. Nice. Best were the game's dream events, which left the real Olympic events behind for some far more extreme challenges. Like Dream Platform, a diving event that showed you falling through the air doing stunts, dodging obstacles, passing through pipes and landing with a splash at the end of it all. But was it all just a big button mashing waggle fest or was it really good enough to warrant that Winter Olympics sequel? That's your cue, Darren. Oh, one face review program initiated. Processing nudes, smoothing textures, analysing expressions, delineating protocols, checking Twitter. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, it's finished. We have a verdict. The Spawn Point viewers think Maru and Sonic at the Olympic Games is awesome. I knew it! Oh, I knew that one. Darren can go feed on some vaults now. Om nom nom. If you'd like your face to take part in the Spawn Point One Face Review, just jump on the Spawn Point website to submit your picks. What have you got for us to process next week, Darren? Hmm. We want you to start sending in your verdicts on Street Fighter Four. Best fighting game of all time, or a waste of pretty polygons? Take a round kick! Cannon drill! Hello, Ken. Well, that's it for another Fast and Furious episode of Good Game Spawn Point, but we'll be back at the same time next week. Same Robo time, same Robo channel. Plus, we'll announce the winner of that Tony Hawk skateboard, and we'll be answering more of your tricky questions in Ask Good Game. Until next time, gamers, hex out. Darren but out. out. Interrupted oh, you. Snap. What are you going to do about it? Charging my laser. No, Darren. No, stop. Shh. He's so quick to temper. One of these days. Affirmative. One of these days.